I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. State Representative Natalie Zeleznikar is here to talk about developments at the Minnesota State Legislature and the Governor's budget proposal. Well, the final 2022 shipping season numbers were released today. We'll talk with Port Director Deb DeLuca. And we'll take you on the trail with a musher and her dogs preparing for this weekend's John Beargree Sled Dog Marathon. Those stories and voices of the region up next on Almanac North. Well, hello once again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. And Julie, for the first time in a while, we're going to drop into the deep freeze this weekend. Well, it seems only fitting before January uh, is on its way. Yeah, <laughs> February is we, just as we cold. We got by pretty, pretty easily We did, January. didn't we? Yep, that's for sure. <laughs> well, let's begin with the headlines. All right, thank you, Denny. Welcome, everyone. The Biden administration this week announced a 20-year moratorium on mining on 225,000 acres of the Superior National Forest. The land borders the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness where Twin Metals has been planning to mine. The move was quickly criticized by Congressman Pete Stauber and Minnesota mining and business groups. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers gave his fifth State of the State speech this week before lawmakers and guests at the state capitol in Madison. The governor emphasized the need to improve education in Wisconsin and announced funding for new education initiatives, including recruiting and training more teachers 2023 will also mark the 175th anniversary of Wisconsin becoming a state. University of Wisconsin Superior Art Professor Tim Cleary recently completed a statue of a labor rights leader displayed at the Minnesota State Capitol. The bronze statue of Nellie Stone Johnson is believed to be the first of a black woman at any state capitol building nationwide. Cleary also sculpted statues of Tuskegee Airman Joe Gomer and former Duluth prisoner of war David Wheat, both on display at the Duluth Airport. Winter lovers can get out and enjoy the season this weekend at the Lake Superior Ice Festival on Barker's Island. The event runs tonight until 9 o'clock and on Saturday from 11 a.m. until 9. There will be ice sculptures, snowshoeing, sliding, food and beverages, and many other activities, culminating with a fireworks display Saturday night. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz unveiled his state budget proposal this week, including a plan to return a portion of the state's record budget surplus to citizens. But lawmakers will have a lot to say about the, the budget before it's enacted. Here to talk about the budget and more is Representative Natalie Zeleznikar, a Republican from Friedenburg mm -hmm. Township, representing House District 3B. And welcome back. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. So you haven't even completed your first real month of the session. But uh, how are things going so far? Is, is St. Paul everything you expected it to be? You know, after running a 24-hour business for 30 <laughs> years and having two kids in competitive hockey, I had good training. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the major bills you're working on, Natalie? You know, I'm, I'm working on health care. You know, we've, I've been spending a lot of time meeting with providers to figure out hospitals can't discharge, nursing homes can't take admits, getting wages increased for, um, you know, nursing home assisted living making sure we have transportation, non-emergency, and EMS for ambulance services, making sure all the spokes in the wheel are there mm -hmm. so that we can care for seniors is one of my number one priorities, uh -huh. and social security cuts. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that uh, allies, aligns with your colleagues in St. Paul? Or do you think that progress is going to be made in terms of, of those issues? That you're On the health care piece, it's interesting because I think we have the largest group of people aging, and I think it's been a topic that's been pushed down the road far too long. So we have a lot of uh, care needs. We have uh, a worker shortage. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be pushing to get us to get this done this session. We can't wait any longer or we'll have a lot of closures. Uh -huh. Natalie, your thoughts on rebate checks, giving some of the state surplus back to taxpayers? Absolutely. 100% yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to re give, we, I mean, a $17 billion surplus says we've taxed the people. That's first. large. Yeah, it's large. It's monumental. Mm -hmm. So. Another, sure. another thing the governor is suggesting is reducing taxes on Social Security. Is that something else that you could get behind? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are there things related to taxes in the proposal that you're not so excited about? I th you know, any time that we can give the money back and make sure we're supporting um, job creators, which are businesses, making mm -hmm. it a business-friendly state, you know, it was, uh, that's, 
and making sure that our, our middle income families aren't getting squeezed. You know, the cost of living is going up for everybody. And so we need to make sure that we're, you know, looking at property tax relief for people because house values have went up, so have property taxes. So those are some of the things I want to see uh -huh. done for our, our citizens up here. Natalie, mm -hmm. I know you're an advocate for gun ownership here in Minnesota. You mm -hmm. feel it's part of our culture? You know, I don't think it's just, it's, it's, it's an amendment right. I mean, it's, it's a right to bear arms. It's clearly stated. And so I think that, yes, I think it's a, you know, law-abiding citizens should be able to have a gun. Mm -hmm. uh, the Minnesota House advanced a bill requiring states' utilities to achieve 100% carbon-free electricity by 2040. Realistic, good for the state as you look ahead? I think clean energy is good for the state. I think it's an unrealistic plan. 100% we don't do for anything. We don't fund anything 100%. And so I'm for having a diversified energy portfolio, which would include hydro, you know, fossil fuels, wind, solar, and all of it. And, a, and an all or none mentality, I think, is going to hurt northern Minnesota, because if we have a blackout, like California or other places, we, we don't have a backup plan. Uh -huh. <laughs> Natalie, oh. how can access for child care services be improved here in Minnesota? Well, I just was touring them today in, in uh, Hermantown and seeing the early childhood programs. So I think having access, having teachers, we need to have child care teachers so that we can have the classes. And so getting um, pathways for health care education in the high schools, health occupation classes for nursing assistants, EMS, and also child care providers I think is huge and then uh, getting the programs to the, to the families. I want to go back to the, the carbon-free electricity yes. for, for a moment because uh, the Biden administration, as we mentioned, has placed that moratorium on new mining near the Boundary Waters, um, effectively killing Twin Metals. Um, what do you think the impact could be? I think it's tragic. I mean, mm -hmm. this very device that everybody in this country uses requires the very minerals we have and right here in our backyard, and we're going to get it from China. So I think it's short-sighted and unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So could that potentially slow down the clean energy in Minnesota? Though? I think it's gonna because solar panels uh -huh. and everything, we're gonna get all of our products from China instead of being able to get things here. So mm -hmm. we could have been creating jobs for northern Minnesota and that doesn't look like it's gonna happen and that's to me tragic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Regarding the economy, Natalie, I know you've said uh, that you have a strong commitment to the trades. How mm -hmm. can we continue to develop that? I just met with you know the superintendents from schools. I've, I've looked at Proctor, how they built houses there. I think we've got to get equipment into the high schools that match uh, what what we're doing, so that the kids have access to you know welding and all the different things, shop classes and all that stuff. That we know, kids know that there's more than one plan. The trades need people, and a lot of entrepreneurs started in the trades, and they've run successful businesses, and they need help. Is it hard to get the trades into the schools? No, I don't think so. I think the trades, the businesses are going to partner together and they want to do that. And I think the schools want to do it too. Mm -hmm. So we need to, that's one thing that's a priority for funding for post-secondary is, is a secondary ed for the two-year programs, one-year programs and certificates. Mm -hmm. Last year, no bonding bill passed. This year, the governor is calling for more than $3 billion in infrastructure uh, projects. Are there local projects that you see coming forward that you could really the Rice Lake Put has a sewer, behind. yeah, sewer water extension that mm -hmm. you know is on there, um, and so that and there's other ones too. Hermantown has a community um, ice arena center that's been on the on the list, and then there's other things in Two Harbors, um, getting land uh, transferred, um, and also uh, the Min Minnesota Department of Transportation has Highway 61. We have gap funding there. So we have many things we're working sure. on for the area. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that it's tough to be a Republican with uh, both houses and the governor's seat in Democrats' hands right now, or are things pretty civil right now? I don't know. I, this is my first <laughs> time. Here's my thought. You know, leadership requires people to be collaborative. So you're not going to get you're not going to get things done across the aisle, whoever, whatever title you have. So, I my style is to be collaborative, let people know. Um, it's a trifecta, so they have the votes to be able to do you know 100% no collaborative. But I don't think that's true leaders. And so I think leadership in business and everywhere else, they work collaboratively to find the best solutions. And I hope we can do that. All right, Representative Natalie Zelesnikar, thank you so much thank for you. coming in. Thank now you get for having some rest me. over the weekend. Yeah, I thank will. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's time now for a voice.
It's time now for Voices of the Region when we hear from an area journalist about stories making news. This week we talked with Marshall Helmberger, publisher of the Timber Jay News and Tower. So we're reporting uh, this week on the financial relief, which is finally on the way for the nearly 500 laid off North Shore mining workers after uh, Governor Tim Wall signed that uh, $10 million unemployment extension package on Wednesday. The bill provides 26 weeks of additional unemployment insurance for workers at the Babbitt Mine and the Silver Bay uh, Pellet Processing Facility. Uh, their benefits uh, had originally run out last November. Um, workers at the facilities were laid off in May of last year after Cleveland Cliff, uh, Cliffs closed the facilities. Uh, the extended benefits are av available for those who have used up their original 26-week benefits and are retroactive uh, to when those benefits ran out. This will affect about 490 North Shore mining employees and five employees of Dino Noble, a mining explosives company, um, who are also expected to benefit. The workers have been in limbo since last May when Cleveland Cliffs idled both facilities in response to changing company needs and an ongoing dispute with the Masabi Trust over royalty payments on ore extracted from the Babbitt mine. Now, in a compromise with Republicans, the company will pay an increased future amount into the state's unemployment fund based on the additional benefits provided in the bill. An original version would have exempted uh, Cleveland Cliffs from that additional tax. Now, based on prior statements by Cleveland Cliffs, the earliest that North Shore workers uh, could expect to return to work is April. Uh, however, Cliffs has already extended the shutdown once before, and company uh, CEO Lorenco Gencalves has begun referring to the facility as a swing plant that will only be run occasionally as market demand requires. We've also uh, been reporting recently on Ely's Nursing Home, uh, the Boundary Waters Care Center, which is experiencing a severe cash flow crunch and is uh, actually reaching out to the community looking for donations uh, to see them through until later this year when they uh, anticipate an influx of state funds that could hopefully help resolve the situation. Uh, nursing Home Director Adam Maslowski, however, is concerned that they may not survive to that point which is why they've reached out to local news media and have sent out about 7,000 letters to area residents asking for cash you know, donations. Uh, they should have gotten some of that funding last year, but the legislature adjourned without reaching a deal on additional health and human services funding. So that's added to the problem. Uh, a number of factors have contributed as well, um, including more vacancies in terms of beds than usual, um, and that, a lot of that is related to COVID. Uh, the severe worker shortage is also impacting the facility because it's forced them to use expensive traveling nurses to meet the staffing needs. And that's increased their payroll costs even as the number of residents has declined. We're also uh, following a new study uh, based on data that was gathered by the Environmental Protection Agency um, in which they uh, tested fish found uh, or caught in lakes and rivers in the U.S. And they found that they contain dangerously high levels of toxic synthetic chemicals known as PFAS. That's uh, acronym PFAS. It's short for perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. And that's part of a family of synthetic chemicals that are known to bring a wide range of health concerns. These PFAS and other closely related synthetics are widely uh, known as forever chemicals. They're known to be persistent indefinitely in the environment. The chemicals appear to concentrate in fish tissue, among other places, and they've become increasingly common in, their envi in the environment since their use in the production of firefighting foam and many other products became more commonplace beginning in the 1950s. EPA testing between 2013 and 2015 showed that even infrequent consumption of freshwater fish was linked to higher levels of these toxic chemicals in human blood. The, the median levels of the chemical detected in freshwater water fish was 278 times higher 
than levels found in most commercially harvested fish. The study uh, cites research that suggests levels of PFAS currently found in most humans may suppress the immune system. And additionally, uh, exposure to PFAS has been associated with many other health harms, including an increased risk of cancer, high cholesterol, thyroid disease, and reproductive and developmental harms. The study also cites data that indicates those who regularly catch and eat fish had levels of these chemicals in their blood ranging from nine and a half to 27 times that of the general US public, which should certainly be raising alarm bells here in Minnesota, where a significant percentage of the population regularly eats locally caught fish. Well, the Duluth Seaway Port Authority released the final numbers of the Twin Port shipping season today. The season was marked by a strong January push to the finish, but still found the overall season down a bit from past years. So here to tell us more is Deb DeLuca, the Executive Director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. Deb, welcome. Thank you very much for being here tonight. So as the shipping season winds up for the year, what was 2022 like for the Twin Ports? Okay, it was it was a really interesting year. So, you, and, and there's lots of little bits to that story. And first, I want to say thank you for having me here. You're very welcome, Danny and Julie. It's nice to see you again. But to, to, you'd have to go back to March of 2022, um, where we had a very late peak ice. Peak ice happened on March 15th. It was 80% ice cover, and that's the latest peak ice we've had since uh, boy since the early 2000s. And so what then happened, the, the Sulox opened only 10 days later and those early ships were facing really tough, heavy ice conditions. And that was exacerbated by the fact that the Coast Guard assets are, you know, that's a diminishing, uh, shrinking uh, and aging fleet. And they had a number of casualties, a number of ships got stuck, needed repair. So very slow start, that just yeah. made it slower. Uh, so it was a slow start to the season and we started, never really caught up. So if you fast forward to, January 15th of 2023, when the Sulox closed, we finished with about 30.4 million tons of cargo. That's that's about 7% off our, uh -huh. our five. Is there any average. ice out there at all this year? Um, you know what? I don't have the current ice covers. It was really- it's it, very little, I'm sure. It was very challenging. Ice again was very challenging in like, like around Christmas, at end of December. Um, and I, but I don't have the current ice cover for Lake okay. Superior. Mm -hmm. You said that the, the tonnage was off by about 7%. Yep. What were the, the, the strong cargoes and yeah. maybe where were they soft? Okay, well, um, iron ore, which is of course king through our port, was uh, about, we had about just shy of 19 million tons, about a couple percentage points off mm -hmm. the five season average. We finished with a really strong, I should, I should have mentioned that January finished with a strong flourish and that was especially true for iron ore. We finished up with uh, 970,000 tons in uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in January alone and that was like the strongest January since the early 2000s mm -hmm. and um, so that was that was very positive um, you know, good year um, other you asked for positive cargoes positive or all and, of them and which ones are soft well coals you know coals just mm -hmm. continue in its precipitous sure. decline with yeah. energy demand changes worldwide that's gone from 20 million tons in the early uh, in the early 2000s to 7 million tons this year the big disappointment was grain. I see. Yeah. Deb, we saw passenger ship traffic return to the Twin Ports last summer. Could that be a possibility in 2023 as well? Absolutely. You'll, you should be seeing a, a number of, you should see the Viking Octantis return to the deck. You'll see a couple of additional um, steam, uh, cruise lines co come into the port as well. Wonderful. Um, so that's an exciting development. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about general cargo. Um, I understand that was a bright spot. You've got the, the CN Duluth Intermodal Terminal running. Yep. Um, talk about how things are evolving maybe at yeah. the port. Sure, well, it was a very positive year yeah. for General Cargo. And for any listeners who don't know, General Cargo, those huge pieces of equipment, yep. they have to get lifted with a crane. Uh, they support our regional industry, uh, mining, manufacturing, uh, wind, uh, power generation. Um, so this year we had like we quadrupled our five season average, 120,000 tons, and that doesn't may not sound like a lot when you compare it to like coal numbers or iron ore numbers, but it's a very high value per ton cargo. The general cargo is, 
And again, uh, and examples that we had coming through the port this year were the um, the 260 foot uh, wind turbine blades. Yes. And the the 125 ton Yankee dryer that went to ST Paper to help that facility reopen. So again, these in, these general cargo support regional industry clean energy. They're good for our port and how our many, region. Deb, how many jobs can be attributed to the port of Duluth Superior? Oh well, let's see. We have about uh, about eight thousand jobs. About eight thousand. Yeah. Uh, how uh, much uh, annual income could that generate then for? Uh, we talk about one point four billion in economic activity or wow. an economic impact to the region. That's based on a twenty eighteen study that I'm glad you asked. We're redoing it currently, <laughs> so we'll have new numbers for you next year. Good. Talk about infrastructure projects that you have going, in, and if you have any uh, anything on the wish list for the legislature this year. Oh, funny you ask. You know that I heard you mention <laughs> in the last se section that the bonding bill didn't pass last year, which meant we didn't have state matching funds to support federal grant requests this last year. Um, yes, we are uh, currently we are building out. If you drive over the Blotnick Bridge, look down at the Port Authority's facility, you'll see what looks like an erector set right now. We're building, we're putting up, um, we're expanding a warehouse, adding 56,000 square feet of warehouse space. That will bring our total warehouse space to uh, just about a half million square feet. And Deb, with that, we have to call it quits. Oh, Thank you very much, Deb so DeLuca, much. Executive okay. Director of the Duluth <laughs> Seaway Port Authority. Thank you, Deb. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, the John Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon begins this Sunday. Our team here at PBS North has been hitting the trails with local mushers as they train for this weekend's festivities. Producer Megan McGarvey traveled up the North Shore to catch up with Jennifer Frecking and her team. It's hard to describe um, working with the dogs on the trail. Running the dogs is uh, kind of, you just feel free and fun traveling the country and kind of see the world through the dogs' eyes. They're always excited to see what's around the next corner and their drive and motivation and enthusiasm. And it's really the, the dogs' love of what we do that makes us so excited to go out with them. Every dog has their own qualities. The team this year is so fun and are so polite. They've been, they've been developing over the last few years, um, but some of my things that make me so happy with my team is how, how connected they are with me. When I, we've had a lot of moose holes on the trail this year, and when I, had, I see moose tracks coming on the trail, they need to slow down. They can, get, they can put a leg into a moose hole and hurt their leg. And when I, I say, easy, and they just whoo, slow down, and they listen, their ears are all pinned back, and they're waiting um, as they dice through the moose holes to, as soon as I'm like, all right, they take off again. And it's really cool to have them that responsive and, and in tune with what I need. Uh, and when I need to stop, like, my team actually bows, which is a rarity with sled dogs. So <laughs> I really appreciate how they just roll in the snow and watch me until I'm ready to go. I'm really not scared of them leaving me, which again is very rare for sled dogs. Usually they just keep trying to ditch you, it seems like. They can pull that snow hook and run. <laughs> so yeah, you know, they're really sweet. They're a really sweet team. Yeah, we're passionate about our Siberian Huskies. They're, they're very well-bred working Siberian Huskies. They've always been bred to be sled dogs. Most of the Siberian Huskies on the, in the world haven't been bred as working dogs anymore. They're pets, they're show dogs, they have other, you know, and you naturally lose some of those traits that are needed to do this kind of, um, uh, you know, sled work. You might remember in 2019 when we had the polar vortex, um, I came in second place. <laughs> My team was so happy. I had all 12 dogs and in second place. And they, it's just, they, they, they run well in all the conditions, but they, and all teams like the cold. They really like 10, 10 below to 10 above. Um, but sometimes when it's colder than that, our dogs are just in their element. And some of the dogs that are more, a little more houndy, you know, a little thinner coated might not be quite as happy. So we, it, for me, it'd be really sad to look out there and not see a really good Siberian team. That's, where we're, I guess, more preservationists. Take pride in those dogs. It's hard to recreate the, the enthusiasm of being at a race. The dogs are so pumped up to be there. So I spent the entire race trying to convince them to run slower, even though it's not like we won the race, I, but I wanted them to pace themselves slower because they, they just, you know, go out here, I can hold them easy at 10 miles an hour. There, they're trying to go 12 miles an hour, and I know that they'll run themselves out of steam. So convincing them they should set our pace, not, you know, not drive that hard. It's hard picking who, who to keep on the team and who not to run. 
which is a good problem to have because they're all so strong and doing really well. So it's hard to decide not who not to take onto the bear, bear grease. I'm just really excited to get out on the trail and enjoy it. It's, it's beautiful conditions. It's been, really been a nice snow season, so the trail should be gorgeous. And I, I, I love the other teams and the other competitors. Um, you know, a lot of these people are people we've been running the, the races with for a long time, and it's always great to get back out there and run the trail with everybody. This year, your daughter is also running in the Bear Grease yes. 40, so <laughs> how does it feel to have that kind of family continuation? Of it's wild, it's really fun. Yeah, seeing her get to uh, connecting with the team and get out on a trail, it'll be her first time to see a, a segment of the Bear Grease Trail, and um, yeah, I know she'll have a great time. Most of the bear time in the Bear Grease often Blake and I are running together, so I do, I love running the trail with Blake, and I guess sometime down the trail, I'll be running that trail with Elena, so that's, that's wild to think about. To follow this weekend's race, join the PBS North team on the trail by visiting our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channels for race updates. And you can keep up with Almanac North by following us on Facebook and Twitter. Head to the PBS North website for program updates and upcoming events. And don't forget to download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. Hope you enjoy your weekend, Julie. I will. It's going to be a cold one. It's well. All right. Bu bundle up, I bundle guess. Bundle up. <laughs> All right. With Julie Zenner, I'm Dennis Anderson. Good night, everybody, and be kind.